As we start this morning, I want to share a secret with you, a secret I've never told anyone before. I'm the guy who makes the tuna fish sandwiches with the pickles in them that you see on the table every Sunday. It's not a big secret, I'm just telling you I never told you that before, but it is a secret. For those who are watching who don't know that every Sunday we have lunch together, we, we bring soup and sandwiches, and somehow in my house I became the guy who was the sandwich guy. I'm not sure how that happened, I suspect Sarah told me you're going to do that, so there I am. And for years now I've been making tuna fish sandwiches, it's always tuna fish sandwiches. Every Sunday morning I'm making tuna fish sandwiches, it's always the way it's supposed to be. About a few years ago, Sarah came and said, you know what, I would really like the tuna fish sandwich. She said, I'd like dill pickles in my tuna fish sandwich because she's a crazy person. So, because I like to listen, oh, everybody else likes it too, okay, that's good, she's not the only one. Because I like to do what I'm supposed to do, I then start putting dill pickle chopped up slices in the tuna fish sandwich. Why am I telling you all this? Well, because last Sunday... I'm making the stuff for the sandwiches and I get to the dill pickle part and I go to the kit, go to the refrigerator and I open the door and I'm looking for the dill pickles and there are no dill pickles, I can't find them anywhere. And, and I'm a little bit rushed, right? There, there's other things I'm thinking about on Sunday morning except sandwiches and so I'm digging through the fridge and I can't find the dill pickles anywhere. So I go to the pantry and I dig through the pantry, I can't find the dill pickles anywhere. I go downstairs to this shelf where we sometimes keep things and I can't find dill pickles anywhere. Come flying back up the stairs and say to Sarah, well, I can't find dill pickles anywhere. <laughs> she says, well, look in the back, there might be some in the back. So I start looking through the fridge again and I'm looking, I find a, bar, a jar of pickles, but it's bread and butter pickles. So I look for more and I say, oh, here's another jar and it's beet pickles. And I look <laughs> right in the back though, in the very back of the top shelf, way in the back corner, is this little tiny jar of sandwich pickles. You know what sandwich pickles are? Dill pickles that have already been sliced ready for your sandwich. I'm like, I'm saved, I've got it. So I reach back there. Now, instead of being the guy that I should have been, instead of undoing all the stuff on the shelf ahead of where that stuff was, I thought I can reach back here and I can grab that dill pickle jar and I can weave it out without moving everything, right? So that, that finds me weaving this dill pickle jar out of the fridge last Sunday morning. And as I'm weaving it out, I hit a container that looks like this, full of hamburgers or something. I, I, I'm pulling this out and somehow I, might, I whack this container and this container falls out, or one like it, falls down, hits the front of the fridge and explodes all over the kitchen. Like there are glass shards everywhere. And I'm less than happy now. And, and there's stuff everywhere. And I want you to think, just for a second, I want you to really guess and think really hard. When this thing hit the ground and exploded, when I'm kind of frustrated and running behind and needing to do dill pickles in the thing, who do you think I blamed for this thing blowing up all over our kitchen? Who got the blame? Sarah. Sarah did. <laughs> Now, the, yeah, she shouldn't have stuffed everything. Why are the pickles in the back? Why do we have to move all these things? Sarah got the blame. Now, to be clear, I'm not stupid or suicidal, so I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> I thought in my head, why did Sarah do these things? But Sarah got the blame, even though it's my fault, right? I'm the guy who didn't move everything. I'm the guy who could have got up earlier to make the sandwiches so I'm not in such a rush. I'm the guy who could have done something different. I could have bought pickles, which she would have told me if I would actually, actually blamed her. Well, you can't go get your own pickles, right? I blamed her because I didn't want to blame me. Why am I telling you that story? Because it's always easier to blame someone else. Right? Our tendency is to blame somebody else. I'm not going to say I did that. Sarah shouldn't have put the pickles at the back of the fridge. That's my first thought. Because it's easier to blame other people than it is to take responsibility yourself. That's exactly what's happening at the start of Mark chapter 4. Jesus has been baptized. That's where we were last week. Grab your Bibles. Mark is where we are. Jesus has been baptized. John the Baptist has shown up. All those things have happened. Jesus has stepped out onto the stage and started preaching. And as Jesus started preaching and telling the truth about all these things to all these people, guess what they did? They got mad at Jesus. 
They didn't want to hear the things he was saying. They didn't want to hear the things he was teaching. So rather than looking at themselves and deciding, maybe I'm not doing what I should be, maybe I should think about these things. Maybe I should think about what God wants. Rather than thinking those things, they started to say, we don't like this Jesus guy. We don't like how he preaches. We don't like the things he says. We don't like the way he acts. We don't like what he asks of us. And people immediately... When Jesus starts preaching, don't like him and blame him. Because it's always easier to blame somebody else than to blame yourself. So in Mark chapter 4, Jesus does something different. Jesus goes from preaching very straightforwardly, and he tries a different method. Instead of telling them what they need to hear, he starts telling them stories. And he starts telling them stories that we call parables. Parables are a story with a point. And he's going to try and get his point across a different way. Mark chapter 4, he tells them a point in a story that they need to hear. If you have it with you, it's a story you've probably heard lots of times, but maybe you'll hear differently today. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. As Jesus began to teach by the lake, a crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat, sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore, water shore's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but because the soil was shallow, or it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns which grew up and choked the plants, so they didn't bear grain. Still other seed fell on the good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. Then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So instead of just preaching very straightforwardly to them and telling them what they should do, Jesus does what every good teacher knows you ought to do. Every good teacher knows that you will have a better response from your students. Your students will learn more if they have to think themselves. If you just spoon feed them everything, they're just going to sit there. But if you make them think, they're going to remember it. And if they think on their own, they'll come to their own conclusion, and it'll be their own conclusion, not yours. So Jesus tells him the story. And then he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You figure it out. Go think about this and see what it means. His disciples think about this for a while and they can't figure it out. They've never heard this story. They're not sure what he's trying to say. So they come to him and say, well, what, what are you talking about, Jesus? What is this story about? So if you still get your Bible open, verse 14, he comes to them and he explains to them what's going on. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on the rocky places, hear the word, and at once they receive it with joy. But since they have no root, it lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution because of the word comes along, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke out the word, making it unfruitful. <clears throat> others, like seed sown on good soil, though, hear the word, and they accept it, and it produces a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. That's a story you've heard lots of times. I want you to think just for about 10 minutes about this story. I want you to notice a couple of things. I want you to notice that there's only three elements in this story. It's a simple story. It was meant to be heard once and understood. 
So there's not lots of detail, but there are three elements to think about. Number one, there is a sower. Ultimately, in this story, the farmer is God himself. In the other Gospels that record this same story, Matthew, Luke, and John, they tell us that either the sower is God or Jesus, same thing. The sower is God himself, and the picture of the sower is interesting, because he doesn't sow like you sow your fields or the people around here sow, with a, with a drill that puts a seed at exactly the right spot, in exactly the right depth, in exactly the right spot. This sower does sowing like they used to. This sower takes a bag of seed, and he walks his field, and he just throws the seed everywhere. The seed goes all over the place. And then later on, he'll come back with his plow, and he'll cover it up with dirt, and then it'll grow. The farmer is sowing the seed everywhere. That's the picture of God in this story. That, that he's not being, he's not counting one seed at a time. He's got handfuls, and he's throwing it around. And when Jesus talks about his father, every time he talks about God in the Gospels, he talks about God being generous and giving abundantly and just throwing his blessings around. That's the picture Jesus says you have to get of the father. You're not wrestling things from God. You're not fighting him for good things. He wants to give you good things. God sows abundantly. In fact, if you're taking notes, Matthew chapter 5, verse 45 says that God sends the rain on the good and the evil, right? Or sorry, he sends the, uh, the sun, he causes the sun to rise on the good and evil, and he sends the rain on whom? The righteous and the unrighteous. God, God's blessings are given everywhere, to those who deserve it and those who don't. To those who will respond, and maybe those who won't. Everybody gets blessed by God. The sun comes up, you're given good gifts all the time. The sower is generous. The sower is constant. The sower doesn't change his pattern. The sower sows. There's a second element in this story, and the second element is the seed. Jesus says in our passage there, he said, the seed is the word of God. The seed is the truth. The seed is good and powerful. Jesus says there is nothing wrong with the seed. In fact, if you're a farmer, you might, you might put it in these terms, it has been to the cleaning thing and come back. It is certified, it is cleaned, it is ready to go. There is nothing wrong with this seed. The seed is perfect. It will not change. It does not change. There is no issue with the seed. The seed is good powerful and perfect and we'll talk more about that in a second in this story that jesus tells about the sower and the soils the only variable the only thing that changes the only thing that determines what happens is the soil itself the sower is generous the seed is good the only thing that changes is whether the soil is good or not and so again, you've probably heard this before, but let's touch on a few of these things really quickly, and then we'll draw some conclusions that we need to draw. Number one, he says, the first thing that happens, sometimes when the seed gets thrown all over the place, it'll fall on the path. Again, fields over in Israel at that time aren't like the fields here where you've got nice quarter sections or full sections of land divided off by grid roads every couple of miles. No, the fields over there are places where people walk where they live, they're small, they're divided up. And so as you walk down the path, throwing your seed out into the field, some of it's falling on the path. And the path is hard, it's been walked on lots. The seed will never get a place to grow. So it just sits on the top. And it just sits there and there is no response until the birds come and take it away. So some people are like that. They'll hear the word of God and it just has no effect on them. Couldn't care less. Clover their ears. They can go to churches and funerals. They can watch their friends die. They don't care. They're not going to think about God. They just don't. They just won't. And so some people are like that. The word of God just has no effect on them at all. He says other people, though, are like seed that's sown among the rocky soil. When I think rocky soil, as I was growing up, I think rocks as in Saskatchewan rocky soil, right? 
If you're a farmer, if you've been to a farm, you've probably seen a rock pile somewhere. If you grew up on a farm, you may have gone out with your rock picker to pick the rocks. Because when I think of rocky soil, I think of soil that has rocks in it. That's not what he's talking about here. In Israel, it's not that you have rocks in your soil, it's that you have rock under your soil. It's that there's a big chunk of granite running through the whole country, and in some places the soil is very, very thin. In some places the soil hardly covers the rock. And if the seed happens to fall there, it might grow for a little while, but eventually the, the roots are going to hit that rocky surface, and that's it. And it's not going to get deeply rooted. So Jesus says when troubles come, some people are like this. They get excited about godly things, and they start to grow, but they're not really deep. They don't have any deep roots. They haven't really depth, thought about this with any depth. They're just kind of coming to church. And they don't really have any faith. They just happen to hang out around people who have faith, maybe. Or their faith is just really a tiny part of who they are. So when trouble comes, it just withers. It just falls apart. It, it doesn't have the roots to sustain them. It doesn't go deep enough, and so they just wither and die. So that could be. So sometimes the, rock, the seed falls on thorny ground. Sometimes... The soil looks decent, but there's things in the soil that shouldn't be there. And he says sometimes those thorns come up and they compete with the godly stuff. It's not that the people who are like this, it's not that they're not godly. It's just that there's a whole pile of other things competing for their time and their attention. All kinds of other things that are competing for their resources. The thorns grow faster than the faith. And so it chokes it out and kills it. We'll talk more about that in a moment as well. Lastly, he says, of course, the soil can sometimes find good places to land. And when it finds a heart that is receptive, when it finds good soil, it not only grows, but it produces. And it produces something 30, 60, or 100 times more than what had been put there in the first place. Good soil produces something. Good soil sees results. Receptive hearts are changed by God's word coming to them. All right, so what are we? We're 10 minutes in, 15 minutes in. I've told you nothing yet that you don't know except that I make the pickle sandwich tuna things, right? You've heard this all before. What are we gonna do with this? Well, the question we need to ask ourselves is not, have I heard this before? The question we need to ask ourselves is, what kind of soil am I? What is my heart like? And here's the answer that every single one of us is going to give. I'm like the good soil, right? Yeah, everybody thinks they're the good soil. You wouldn't be here if you didn't think you were receptive to the things of God. You wouldn't be here if you didn't care about the Bible. You wouldn't be here if you didn't want to worship. You wouldn't be here if you weren't interested at all. Of course I'm the good soil. But the actual answer might be different. So sometimes when you hear something too much, you don't actually hear what it's saying. So can we reframe this a little bit for a second? Can I give you some different questions to ask? Can I ask you not what kind of soil are you? Can I ask you three different questions? Let me ask you a question of character. What kind of person are you actually becoming? If you think about yourself right now, and think about yourself 20 years ago, are you kinder now than you were then? Are you more gracious to people or more critical? Are you more giving and generous, or are you holding on tighter? Are you a person who looks for the good in others, or do you look for the thing you dislike about them? These are character questions. Who are you really? And what is shaping your life? What is making you into who you are? Did you hear Daryl's prayer? Did you hear Daryl thank God that we could come together and worship, 
But did you also hear him pray that you would open your own Bible once in a while and do that on your own so that you're not just shaped by TV or social media or your friends, but maybe you'd be shaped by some words of God that you read on your own. Did you hear him pray for that? What is shaping us? What is making me who I am? Am I comparing myself to the things of God's word or am I comparing myself to my friends? What am I being shaped by? Those are character questions. Who am I becoming? That is a great question to ask yourself, not just in these four minutes, but later on today, later on this week, when you get some quiet time. Who am I really? Do I like who I am? <coughs> character questions will help you figure things out. Second question, how do I define success? This is a question of our values. What do I really value? What would make my life successful? And how am I deciding whether I'm successful or not? Very interestingly, let me point out to you that some of the things that we use as our success measurements, Jesus put in the thorn soil section. Right? When Jesus was describing the thorns that kill faith among us, he said, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for things other than the things of God will kill the things of God in us. <clears throat> Worrying about this life too much, the desire for wealth, and wanting something more exciting will kill the things of God in us. Now, the interesting thing is, most of your friends are measuring their success by what they have. Most of the people you know are measuring their success by how big their bank account is. Most of the people you know are measuring their success by what kind of vehicle they drive, what kind of house they have, what they can count. And Jesus says that's not a very good way to measure. Those are the things, those valuing those things will kill godly things in us because they will compete for our time. They will compete for our attention. They will compete for what's important. So Jesus would ask you, what do you really value? What do you really care about? What is the most important thing to you right now? That'll tell you what kind of soil you really are. Last question I want to give you is a question of legacy. Maybe this one's better, easier to answer than the other one. Sometimes we're too close to the other ones. It's hard for us to think about what's shaping me right now or what am I listening to. Hard to figure out maybe what do I really value. This one's pretty clear and pretty easy to get to. A legacy question. When it comes time for your funeral, when it comes time for someone, possibly me, to stand up here in front of a room full of people who knew and loved you, what do you want us to talk about? What do you want remembered? How do you want to be remembered? What do you want to be remembered for? At the end of your life, what would you like people to say about you? That legacy question is pretty easy to answer, I think. I think we can figure out, if I'm the guy here, I want you to say that I was fun, and I was nice, and I was kind, and I was loving, and I tried to help people, and I tried to be a good guy, and I wasn't hard to deal with, and I was whatever. I think I can answer those, this question, what do you want me to be remembered for? I can answer that. Then I need to think backwards and say, okay, I'm here right now. What am I doing right now so that people remember me the way I want to be remembered? Right? What am I investing in? Where am I spending my time? How am I tre actually treating people? What am I doing that will be remembered? And would I like to be remembered for the way I am right now? Or, or am I just going to make Tim get up and lie about me? And say things that aren't really true? And by the way... I've done it. Not, not with people who are here. But I've, I've, I've done funerals for families where the kids had nothing good to say about their dad at all. Nothing. Like literally nothing. I had to 
scrounge for anything. So he didn't leave a very good legacy. Again, I think these questions are worth some thought. Take a picture of them. I'll send them to you later. Write them down. I don't care. But these things are worth thinking about because, again, they will help you answer the question, what kind of soil are you really? Are you overrun by too many things? Are you actually investing in the right stuff? Are you good soil or not? That's really a question worth some thought. Now let me give you two quick observations here and we'll wrap it up and let you go. Two quick observations. Number one, you can change the soil you are. You can be different. I said the only variable in the story was the soil part. The sower is always generous. The seed is always useful. The soil is the thing that changes. So we can change that. And the answers to these questions only hurt us if we never ask those questions. The answers to those questions only hurt us if we're unaware. As soon as we become aware of it, as soon as we think about it, as soon as we decide, well, no, no, I want to be the right kind of person, then we start moving that way. It's automatic, but we've got to become aware of it. So the good news is, we can get better. We can change. We can be who we should be. We can be different types of soil. And here's the second good news. As I said, the seed is powerful. Jesus said once that seed finds good soil, soil that really is receptive, soil that really says, I want to try this. I want to see what God would do in my life if I let him. Jesus says the seed will grow. In the parable of the sower, he says it'll grow 30, 60, or 100 times more than what you imagined. You'll be receiving all kinds of stuff. But he goes on from there. If you still have Mark open, um, he says later on, let me tell you more about this seed. Down in verse 26, he said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts. And the seed grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he goes and puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. Do you hear what he's saying? He says, if you will be good soil, if you'll be receptive to God, if you'll just give it a try, just try it. Just give it a chance. He says, something will start happening in your life. You won't even know how it happens. You won't even have to make it happen. This farmer doesn't even know how the seed grows. It just grows on its own. Just give it a starting point. Give it a chance. Try it. There's a preacher down south that I listen to once in a while, and that's his challenge all the time. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe me. You don't even have to believe the word. Just try it. Just see if it works. Give it a try. Turn the other cheek once in a while. Be generous. See if it's better. Just give it a try. See if something grows. Can that be our challenge? Can we just try? Let's try. Give it a shot. He goes on to say in another verse, just a couple of verses down, verse 30, he says again, what is the kingdom of God like, or to what should we describe it? It's like a mustard seed which is the smallest seed you can plant in the ground, yet when it's planted, it grows and becomes the largest of the garden plants. So it starts small even. Just even something small will grow into something big if you let it. Just try. Give it a shot. Be receptive. Stop saying that sounds silly. Give it a shot. See what happens. The point of the sermon is simply this. If you remember nothing else, remember this. That change and growth is not random. Change and growth is not random. It is not a matter of luck. We change and, when we, and we grow when we decide to. We change and grow when we receive the word of God and say, okay, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. My encouragement to you today is this. I would encourage you to let God do more and more in your life. Lean on him. Pray more. See what happens. 
give it a shot. Just be open and say, okay, I'm willing to be used. Do whatever you want to do. Change whatever you want to change. Help me be better. Good soil produces more than you ever could imagine. Give it a shot. Jesus one time said this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. He said, the message of the cross is foolishness to some people. Some people look at it and say, this is the dumbest thing ever. How can you believe this? Because their soil's not well. Their soil isn't right. To some, it's foolish. But to those who are being saved, to the good soil, to those who are receptive to God, it is the actual power of God. It is the way you get through. It is the way you make it. It is the way you understand everything. It is the way who, that makes you who you are. The cross of Christ doesn't change. It's how we hear it. It's how we receive it. I don't know what you need to do this week. I don't need to, I don't know who you need to forgive this week. I don't know who you need to like more this week. I don't know what changes you need to make. But can I tell you this? Jesus says, if you let him, he can change everything. For the good. And he will do it. All you've got to do is accept that. Receive it. Give it a try. Parable of the soil says the only variable is us. Sheldon's going to come and do the jig. Jim sent out his, his article about reception. I thought that we need to be receptive of his word. And I chose this passage of scripture. And it's Galatians 2, 15 through 21. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If, while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners. Does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroy, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law, I die to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I will no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. We all know that Christ is our mediator our mediator between us and God. When we pray, we always, at the end of our prayer, say in Jesus' name, or through Jesus, because everything that we ask of God, if it's blessings or a request, goes through our Savior. Our inheritance also comes through Christ. And in pleasing God, we need to honor our Savior. And that is what we do when we remember the Lord's life, 
his death and his resurrection as we partake of this communion. Let us thank for the bread. Heavenly Father, as we gather together, that we remember, remember the plan that you set for us. And the only way that plan works is through our Savior. Help us this morning as we focus on when Jesus that is our example, that is our guide. And we thank you now for his body as we take this bread. Through Jesus we pray, amen. Lord, just help us to be an example to others that they can realize the importance of what Jesus has done in our lives. We thank you now for the spirit of life that brings back the army and the blood, how important it was on the cross. And through his blood, there will be a resurrection. In Jesus we pray. We don't have to do anything. We have to let God do some things. Uh, we don't have to make things happen. We need to be receptive soil where he can work. I don't know what happens in this week. I don't know what's coming, but it'll be a better week if we follow closer to Christ. If we let him work in our lives, and if we allow him to do the things that he wants to do. That's my prayer for you this week, and the prayer for all of us as well. Thanks for watching.